Okay. Uh, I um, just wanted to take this time to just introduce myself really quickly, and I want to talk about marketing. And um, I have a little bit of a different perspective because I have kind of seen companies all the way from Series A, B, C, E, and now I'm in a public company. So I just wanted to share my perspective of what happens uh, as a company scales and how marketing in particular needs to keep up. I also talk a little bit about sales, so think of it as a go-to-market sort of an approach. So um, I've been fortunate enough to be associated with a, a couple of companies that have had some strong exits. Dropbox, we went public uh, in uh, 2018. Outlet was another company I joined. We went public in 2021. And then I'm sure many of you have seen the news that Clavio uh, recently filed for an S1. Um, and so I've seen what it takes to uh, be in companies and be part of companies that are uh, scaling up super rapidly and getting to some kind of an exit. Now I'm with a company called Lightspeed, not Lightspeed Ventures. It's called Lightspeed Commerce. We are a POS company, POS and payments company. Um, we are about 750 million in revenue. We are a publicly traded company on NYSE and Toronto Stock Exchange. We do fintech and SaaS. So it's given me a you know full perspective on. What, it go, what, what happens when you go from a Series A company all the way to a public company? And what are all the differences when you think about sales and marketing? So let's start uh, by defining what the problem statement is. As you think about companies that grow and scale and iterate and innovate, marketing never, never um, stays the same, right? Because marketing is kind of at the heart of uh, company strategy, marketing as a function needs to evolve every, in every stage of the company and pretty much every 18 months, especially if a company is growing super strongly. So how do we as marketers evolve to add maximum value in this situation? For me, the other additional complexity that has started is in the last you know, 10 years or so, it was, a, it was a giant arms race, right? It was all about how quickly can you grow? Don't care about profitability just throw uh, money and bodies at things. But now we are in this environment where smart growth is where it's at. We have to be accountable to profitability. We have to be accountable to efficiency. We have to think about, as a company, how we can reduce, continue to reduce our costs and drive more ROAS, drive you know, lower payback periods. And so smart growth is the context we are operating in. So if you take that, companies evolve. Smart growth is where we're at. It's like a collision of, uh, it's like a perfect storm. And so the, the, there are some things I feel like we as marketers should be really on top of to make sure that we don't get lost in this, in this perfect storm. So let's talk about what those things are. For me, the first thing uh, that, you, that, uh, that starts all of this is where you're on uh, in terms of a product maturity curve really determines your marketing strategy. And marketing strategy, basically, what, what it is, is you're defining the brand, you're thinking about your customers, you're outlining your benefits, and you're really crafting an experience for them, right? And when you think about the product marketing, sorry, the product maturity curve, how, where is the product uh, in terms of its maturity? Is, there, is it a, a product that already has a product market fit? Is it a scale-up kind of a company? Is it a optimize? Is it adding new products to create a platform? Where do you stand in that whole uh, ecosystem, in that life cycle? And then how does a marketing strategy kind of align with that? So for me, the big idea here is, what's the most uncontested market space and what will it take to capture it? I think of it this way. So if you look at that crossing the chasm, right? I'm sure most of you know what that is. There is the early, so early adopters, late adopters, early majority, late majority and laggards. And, and we as marketers also come up with this idea of ICP, ideal customer profile. That's your early adopters, right? For most of the companies that you begin with, your ICP is your early adopter who knows your product, who's looking for that solution and was like, yes, this is exactly what I need. So that's kind of an easy market to go after. But this, uh, the trickier one is what I call the ICP plus, which is basically the people who have to be educated on your product. So at a previous company, um, we said, okay, these are people who have a need, who have an urgent need, so they're going to sign on to this product or service. But then there's all this other, uh, uh, this customer base who have some kind of objection to switching. 
either because they think, oh, it's too costly, or I don't want to take the risk, or I'm comfortable with my solution. So they have, they miss out on coming to your product because they don't really have a way of thinking about your product. So you have to create urgency, you have to create FOMO. That's what happens in that ICP plus segment. And then the last one is the late majority. For me, this is about customers you want to cultivate in the long term. They may not be your immediate um, high economic value buyers, but they are some people that you want to go after for the, for the long term. So the primary marketing focus to me is this early adopters and uh, late adopters. How do you go after them in the most cost effective way possible? And so when you think about how a company scales, this you have to keep this in mind all the time as you go up. So that leads us to, as a company grows, what I have seen over and over is complexity just expands. You were a one product company going after one market, and all of a sudden now you have a couple of products, and you are going after two different audience segments with three different uh, go-to-market motions. Uh, and suddenly, you look at the vectors of growth, and you have all of these things happening. Right? You have different audiences. You have different products. You have different personas. What I mean by persona is if you are an enterprise motion, for instance, you not only have a decision maker, but you also have an influencer. You have a budget owner. And so it becomes, you have a buying committee that's not as, as straightforward as one single persona. So the main takeaway here is don't oversimplify this complexity. And there are ways to do that. For me, the, you have to address five different questions. And I'll kind of page through this super quickly. What is the big insight that drives urgency for your ICP? What is the new category you want to go after? And to be frank, what is, why do customers care about that particular category that you want to dominate? Um, where do you want to play versus not play? You might want to say, no, I don't want to play in this you know, self-serve part of the market because I don't have a self-serve product. Our customers don't buy self-serve. They need hand-holding. That's completely fine. Just make sure that you put that strategic bet on. How do you want to win? And what are the growth levers you want to try to scale? So you might say, outbound field motion is just not my jam. I don't know how to start it at this point. And I think we can you know, punt that for a few years. And that's completely fine. But you have to make sure that you take those strategic bets, or else you're going to end up with a lot more complexity that you won't be able to simplify. So talking about go-to-market motion, I, you know, like uh, KYC is know your customer. I think it's equally important that we know what the motion is that the company has and is organically built to deliver. And what I mean by that is the following. So you, you, we generally have two motions, right? PLG and SLG. SLG, PLG is product-led growth. SLG is sales-led growth. And um, I mean, there's community-led growth, partner-led growth. So I'm kind of ignoring that for just one second because these are the two big ones. So when you think about PLG or SLG, a lot of companies start by saying, I have a SaaS product that appeals to a certain part of the market. That's my ARPU is like maybe you know, $10 a month. So I am going to create a PLG motion, and I'm going to make sure that our customers are able to self-serve themselves onto this product. On the other end of the spectrum, you might have products that are so complex that you can only sell through sales teams to enterprise buyers, CIOs, CTOs, and whatnot. Generally, people's, uh, companies start at either one end of the spectrum, and over a period of time, they kind of migrate across. Uh, PLG-oriented um, company starts to think, OK, maybe there is more value in the up market. Let me see how I can go capture that market. A company that started as an SLG motion starts to think, maybe I should go after the lower end of the market and figure out how to do uh, self-serve. Either way is fine. Um, my advice to a lot of companies that are going through this migration is really make sure what your strengths are. And when you, when you are able to migrate to that other end of the spectrum, make sure that you're hiring the right people and setting it up in the right way. The other thing that, that's interesting here is there's an overlap as uh, this, oh, there, as this points out. So there is a motion where you can create this thing called um, a hybrid PLG SLG motion. So in Dropbox, um, they, there was a motion called self-serve sales assist, which was incredibly successful. And what that was was you bring people in through the self-serve channel, but they are 
complex buyers, so you introduce a light sales touch model to help them get over the hump of onboarding and uh, buying the product. So you can see that there is ways to do this so that you can start to test the waters of the things that you don't have today and where you want to get to. So my advice to a lot of companies who are thinking about So I'm moving forward. Ah, there we go. Thank you. Um, my advice to a lot of companies is think through what the, this means for, for you. So if you're a self-serve go-to-market motion, you want to really have capabilities and focus on onboarding, you want to have web optimization, funnel optimization, you want to have data, analytics, all the kind of stuff. If you're a sales enablement, a sales motion, then you want to make sure that you have account-based marketing, you have a, a marketing team that can support a field sales motion, you have event marketing, you have analyst relations, all that kind of stuff. And if you're in that middle, uh, the, it's, it's both a light uh, touch as well as a high volume kind of a play. So make sure you have inbound SDR support, you have marketing nurture series and so on. So it's super important to make sure you lay out what it is that you want to focus on and how you want to converge on uh, which side of the equation. Hope that's making sense. Um, but in all of this, the one thing you can't forget is your brand becomes super important, right? Brand investment is the big question mark in the industry right now. How much do you invest? Where do you invest? At what point of time do you do? How much do you surge uh, in terms of brand investment? Uh, and is the, uh, are there ri the right are there right levers? How do you measure the brand, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera? In my experience, what I have seen, <laughs> sorry is that there are two approaches to building a brand. You can say, I'm going to go create this huge buzz in the market, throw you know, a few million dollars in certain markets, geographies, whatnot, and do out of home advertising, billboards, uh, you know, the tube in London, so on and so forth, which we have done, and, and, and try to get a couple of percentage points of uh, unaided recall in terms of brand awareness up which then probably sustains you over a period of time. You could do that if you have a bunch of money. Or the other way that I've seen us do is really start building out your brand from bottom up. What I mean by that is really identify your ICP segments and say, I'm going to go be in front of these people in the right ways, in the right, at the right events, with the right trade publications, in the right you know, kind of webinars, forums, whatever, and start to build my brand presence with these small groups of customers. And either way is a completely fine approach, and I've basically worked on both of these. Um, but it's very important to know, uh, to address a few questions. One is, how fast do you want to build a brand? So before we went to uh, went IPO in Dropbox, we decided we really wanted to make a big splash. So it was all about the stop down. Just go do a bunch of things to get the brand out there. The second question is, um, what is the long-term aspiration of building the brand? Because once you invest in brand building, if you don't continue to invest, your brand-aided awareness starts to go down because there's so much happening in the market that you're going to start losing uh, brand awareness. So how much can you continue to invest in that? This, the third thing, obviously, is what is your appetite for um, how much you, uh, the, the kind of brand you want over a long period of time? If it's okay for you to have a brand presence with your ICP, that's, you know, that means that, let's say you're selling HR tech, you only want to be known in the HR community. You don't care about know, being known in the, the IT community or the CIO community. And are you, uh, what, what does your product vision stand for? Are you planning to expand beyond a certain use case into other so that it becomes important to start building the brand outside or are you okay just staying in one lane? Those are the three questions you would want to think about when you uh, build a brand. And one thing I wanted to talk about really quickly was this idea of, one thing uh, was when you, when you build a brand organically, it's, it's fairly easy in that you, you start with a product and then you start probably creating sub-brands of all the different products that you um, launch, right? So you have company X, and then you have company X um, retail, company X, X, Y, and Z kind of a thing. When you are in a situation where you have acquired a bunch of companies or you're planning to acquire companies, 
you kind of go through a little bit of an evolution of your brand. You start with saying, I'm a house of brands today. I've acquired a bunch of companies, so I'm going to start with this, this idea of an endorsed brand, which is, so when we acquired Hello, uh, Hello Sign at Dropbox, we said Hello Sign by Dropbox, so it's endorsed by the company. Then you incorporate that into your um, company, and then finally it becomes a branded house. So you have all of this under one umbrella, it becomes a branded house. And so there's a bunch of things that you, this uh, takes into account as you go through it. How you position, what kind of category you're creating, how do you integrate the products together so that there's one single experience for customers, how do you integrate go-to-market motions, et cetera, et cetera. The important takeaway here is just know where you are on this journey as a company that's scaling up and make sure you're making the right decisions on how to build your overall brand. Speaking of how to increase your brand awareness, one of the most important things is ecosystem, right? So in all the companies that I've been at, the partner ecosystem has probably been one of the biggest amplifiers to getting a brand name out, but also acquiring the right kinds of customers. And if, you've, if you're doing this right, this can become easily a really, really important, um, economically valuable way of approaching customers. So the two things I wanted to point out here are, actually, if you can go back one more, sorry. Um, the two things I wanted to point out here are, there's an element of partner acquisition. So you want to make sure that you're acquiring the right kind of partners. And then when you acquire them, there's an element of partner enablement, um, which is down here. Which is, uh, which is basically how you enable them to continue to improve their um, economics. So, sorry, if you go to the next one. And, and the, the next tip, pro tip for me is, I know you guys have all heard of ABC always be closing. For me, ABC is always be connecting. As a, as a marketing organization, you are sort of in this nexus, if you go to the next slide, uh, you're sort of in this nexus of having to really collaborate between product, finance, sales, and customer success, right? And, and marketing is kind of the unique um, organization that has to bring all of these groups together. So take, take uh, for as an example, take a pricing project. Let's say you want to increase pricing on your current products, or you want to change the packaging of your current products, introduce add-ons, whatnot. You have to be able to talk to product and say, what kind of add-ons can we actually create? What, is the, what are the feature sets? How do we categorize the feature sets? You want to talk to sales and see how they can actually sell the add-ons. Are they willing to you know, discount add-ons? Are they willing to go to their customers and sell the packages? Are they willing to take the prices to their new customers? You want to take, go to customer success and be able to talk, um, get them to understand how they can onboard customers so that they can add on the right kind of packages. And then most importantly with finance, you have to think through what is the margin impact of having pricing and packaging decisions. All of this, as you can see, this is marketing's job, right? Coordinating all of this across all of these different groups. So for me, the connection part becomes super important. So I use this, uh, this thing called red threads that you see up there on the headline. What is a red thread? Red thread is basically a thing that you, um, identify as a theme in the company that you want everybody to be, uh, to be speaking about. So at Lightspeed, my current company, our red threads are serving complexity, serving scale, and innovation. So what we are trying to do is, no matter which organization you are in, you always want to uh, create the drumbeat of how are we becoming more innovative? How are we serving cu customers through complexity? How are we serving scale? And so this becomes a way to align everybody around what, um, what you want to go to market with. The next one. So if you're in any size marketing organization, I am sure people are having conversations with you about how are you reducing marketing budget, right? Common uh, kind of a, a connection point between CMO and CFO right now is, hey, your uh, marketing as a percentage of spend, uh, per, uh, marketing spend as a percentage of revenue is way higher than uh, benchmark and peers. How are you going to reduce this? For me, this is something that we as marketers need to be doing proactively. Almost everything that we do, particularly in performance marketing now, can be so much more optimized because of the tools you have available with 
Meta and Google and all these big companies. And there are so many things out there that, are, um, that we can leverage as marketers. So if you go to the next slide. The, uh, the, the, the big thing to take away here is there are thousands of things that we can do, right? But I wanted to show, show you a couple of examples of things that I've done in the past. So for instance, they, you can use a lot of ML and AI right now to drive what is called predicted LTV of customers and optimize your bidding when you go after those customers. So you can say, I, right now my CAC for this particular customer is, let's say, $200. But my predict, my, uh, what I'm getting from them as an MRR or ARPU is like 100 bucks, but I know that they're going to stay for 10 years with me. I'm going to upsell them on X, Y, and Z. So the predicted MRR for them is going to be 300 bucks. And so you can use that to go back and bid for customers at that higher level, which mean, means you get higher quality customers, which basically means that you are driving your efficiency, you're driving ROAS, all of that stuff. So. Um, this, this is just one tactic that you can explore to figure out how you can drive more and more optimization. The second thing is uh, the handoff between marketing and sales. I cannot tell you the number of times I've gone into a company and said, wait, but do sales and marketing talk to each other every single day? Why not? We, we, I've been in situations where marketing spends money acquiring leads on the weekends, right? There's nobody on the weekends on the sales side to convert those leads. Why are we spending money on the weekends to acquire those leads? So there's so many basic funnel problems that happen in, in that handoff that it's worth exploring whether there are those um, optimizations you could do. And then finally, creative testing. I cannot tell you the number of times that I've gone into a company and we've had one ad running for millions of dollars of uh, budget. Just one ad, because it's working. Wait, but we need to try different things, right? To go after different audiences. No, but it's one ad, it works. So constant creative testing is, is one thing. So if you go to the next one, um, I'll briefly fly through this. The most important thing when you think about that idea of creative uh, testing is how do you know what you want to put in front of people and why, right? And this all comes down to positioning. You have to know how to, if you go to the next one, you have to know what kind of company you are to begin with. And this is not a framework that I built up, by the way. There's a, a book by Andy Cunningham uh, called uh, Getting to AHA, which is a fantastic book about positioning. And she talks about the idea that are you a product company, are you a customer company, are you a concept company? And um, so an example is Apple, in her mind, is a concept company because it creates the idea of what uh, vision can be, what the world can be. Whereas um, an Intuit is a customer company because they're really hyper-focused on customers. So I asked this question of my CEO recently and it helped clarify what we were. In his mind, we are a customer company and so all of the conversations started to happen around how do we serve customers? And that leads to how do we want to position ourselves? So if you go to the next slide, um, here you can see positioning is an, effort, is an activity that you undertake both looking at it inside out and outside in. So you think about category, you think about the context, you think about the competition, and then basically you, you lay out a statement like this that says, my company is a customer-oriented company, we are in the POS category providing X, Y, and Z, what is the differentiation, et cetera, et cetera. When you have this, it feels like that zipline underlines my points. <laughs> when, we, when we have this as a positioning statement, then we start to get very creative in terms of how we go and create the ads that we put out on the, in the market, the blogs, all of the different tactics that we uh, employ. Then I want to talk about um, something that I get questions on all the time. So I've grown teams from, I mean, I've, um, I've had teams of 10 people, I've had teams of 150 people, I've grown a team from 25 to 150 people and the big question I get all the time is, what's the important thing as you scale up the marketing org? Because if you don't do it fast enough, you miss out on opportunities. But if you do it too quickly, you add so much OPEX, you and your CFO are not going to be best friends. Right, so what, is the right what are the right vectors of growth? So if you go to the next slide, the way I think about marketing org and scaling them up is, there are two kinds of people, right? They're specialists and they're generalists. 
And you have to know when to hire generalists and when to hire specialists for what kind of functions. And to me, that's really driven by what kind of capabilities are you planning to build. So when I mean capabilities, I'm talking about ABM, I'm talking about SEO, I'm talking about CRM, I'm talking about some of these things. And some of them are basic. You have to have an SEO, you have to have demand gen, you have to have those basic things. But then it starts to get nuanced when, okay, do I need a, um, do I need a full self-serve team? Do I need a growth hacking team? Do I need a field sales marketing support function? So when you start to map out what you want and what you want to put together, you have to be very, very careful that you are doing what you need for the growth of the company. Second, always make sure that the headcount is right sized. I get a lot of questions of what percentage of the marketing team should be brand versus demand gen. There's no clear answer, but you don't want to over invest in resources that are not driving direct revenue. So one model I've seen work is roughly 60% of your marketing team should be in some kind of a revenue generating capacity. Now that worked for a high growth model, which wasn't fully uh, thinking about brand at that point, but when you grow and mature and you're competing in a very crowded market space, that, rev uh, that ratio might get flipped. So you, you really have to think about how to right size your team. The last one I'll say is the framework for how you bring these teams together. As you grow the marketing team, it becomes really, really important that they're all stitched together. They're all singing from the song, same songbook, right? Uh, because as you grow the team, uh, things start to get siloed. And how do you make, continue to make the, the bridges together? The, the one really good um, tactic I've seen work is on this note, on the Unifying framework, demand gen folks do not be afraid to put them on commission plans, similar to how you would have for SDRs and BDRs because that really helps drive a lot of accountability. It won't work for everybody, every context, but commission plans in a lot of cases really do work. Okay, so the last one I have is um, a little bit more meta, which is when you're in a company, when you're in a product that's, let's say, competing in a very crowded market space versus you're in a company that's really blowing the doors off and creating a new category, the two personas I see marketers wearing, uh, sorry, the, the two hats that I see people wearing is, are you what I would call a map maker or a market creator? So I'll, I'll say a few more words on, about that. So for me, um, let's say if the board comes to you and says, what is our path to getting to 20% penetration in this, in this market, right? That automatically assumes you have a great product market fit and all you're doing is scaling that up super rapidly and getting more and more market share. Versus, let's say the board comes to you and says, wow, this is a whole new category. Um, we need to really make some buzz around it and educate people that this is a new category and uh, do that a whole category creation thing. Those are very different guidelines, right? Category creation is a humongous effort and it's not something that you take on lightly. And it's not something you take on when you are, let's say, number two in the market. You really take it on when you have conviction that you are going to go create a whole different thing that, no, that people have never really thought about. Uh, think about what Qualtrics did with experience management, for instance. And they're still working on category management, right? Even years and years later. The map maker part for me is, is, a, is a whole different set of tactics because what you're doing there is figuring out how to really optimize the market that you're already in and getting to a certain share in the market. So when you think about marketing strategy, use this as a framework to lay out your tactics. If you're a map maker, you are looking at, okay, funnel optimization, you're looking at go to market, you're looking at audiences, you're segmenting your audiences. If you're a category creator, you're thinking lightning strike, you're thinking big broad based positioning, you're thinking uh, a few years out. And that brings me to uh, another one thing I want to leave you with is, as you think, if you go to the next one, if you think about um, the market, actually, you can just page through the whole thing. Thank you. So if you think about this, mo uh, this model, right? On this axis, you have people in the market that are potentially informed of your product. So think of Airbnb. Most of us are informed about Airbnb. <laughs> 
are we all ready to go book an Airbnb um, and, and use it? Maybe not, right? So in the SaaS world, you have similar uh, kind of groups of buyers. You have people who are ready, um, who are, sorry, who are informed but not ready. You are people who, who, you have people who know what they want, but they don't know about your product. And the sweet spot for you is this, which is the people who know, oh, okay, I know this product, I have an urgent need to solve this problem, I'm gonna go do it. And that's typically your funnel, right? So you can see on the right uh, side, the tiny box is your funnel. These are the people who are in your funnel, converting them, hopefully you don't lose them, et cetera, et cetera. But the most important thing is you have to map out, okay, what's my um, focus? Is it this one or is it this one? Which of them uh, creates a bigger market share and market impact? Am I really going after the people who, um, who don't know about me, but, uh, or sorry, am I going after the people who know about me but may not be in the market, or am I going after the people who don't know about me at all, so there's no brand awareness, but they have a problem that I want to go solve? Once you map this out, your life becomes so much easier because you know what tactics you want to align with what kind of a problem you're going after. And by the way, this becomes another red thread, right, that you can align with on uh, with uh, sales and uh, customer success and product and finance and so on and so forth. So with that, I will end with the three things I would love for you to all remember. One is your location on the, your product maturity curve really determines your market strategy, marketing strategy. Know your brand, make sure it shows up in all of your touch points. That's the best way to build a consistent brand and then Recognize growth opportunities. One motion is not enough. Pricing and packaging may be in your future. Geographic expansion may be in your future. There's a fourth one here that I didn't add, which is at the end of the day, this is my experience, my, advi my advice, but trust your gut because there's nothing like you knowing what your unique context is and knowing what your CEO wants, what your board wants, and you have to be able to create a playbook based on what you know. And these could all just be guidelines there's never going to be a single silver lining truth kind of a thing about any of this that I presented. So I think that's all I have, and now it's open to Q&A. Hi, thank you so much. This has been really helpful. How, how much do you mix data and metrics into the decisions and paths yep. that you've outlined here versus just yep. sticking to this? Yeah, it's a great question, right? Uh, because most of uh, the, I'd call the programmatic things around performance optimization, or sorry, performance marketing, demand gen, all of that, when you have the data, it's easy to optimize that and just use the data to say, where is the market? How much are we converting? What do we need to do X, Y, and Z? But then I think about positioning and brand, and there you really have to have an intuition, and you have to have a gut. Um, and you have to say, okay, are these, you know, even things like, are these the right colors that are going to resonate? You can never test your way to what color palette you want to put in front of customers, because every customer is going to have a different viewpoint. And that's where you have to have a vision and say, this is my strong feeling about what I think it should be and how I want, it to, con want to convey it. And I do think that all comes from customer, um, immersing yourself in customers. So at one of my previous companies, uh, over the space of one month, I did 200 customer interviews. And so it just really gets you in the, in the, in the, in the body of a customer, if you will, to understand what they're going through, what their mental model is. And that starts to build your gut. That's a great question. Oh, hi. Thanks hi. for the presentation. I think it was really insightful. Cool. Uh, you're talking about ecosystem, right? Yeah. That was a very good strategy. Yeah. But the thing is, I saw a lot of ecosystem strategies yeah. do not work well. So my question is, what yeah. would be the, mo the, the main metrics that you could measure uh, yeah. your ecosystem motion and you say, okay, I'm right, I'm going to the right direction or this yeah. is not going right? What would be the main yeah. three metrics? So I start with uh, the, you know, I sh showed the partner acquisition and partner enablement. I always start with measuring the partner enablement piece. So for all the partners I brought on board, how many of them have been getting us the leads that we want? And how many of them have been converting? What is the ARPU of that conversion? And so looking at, are we, are we uh, uh, getting enough leads at the right level from our partners and then converting them? Do we have a playbook there? Do we have an engine there? 
And then if there is a business there, to your point, and maybe sometimes it's not, then uh, if there's a business, then you go back and try to acquire more partners of, of that nature. The, the interesting thing about partner ecosystem is you can have data partner, uh, product partnerships, right, which just extend your product. You can have agency partnerships where basically they're reselling your product, or you have system integrators who are just, you're, they're white labeling what you have. You just have to be really clear about what kind of partnerships work for your context. So it could be that one of those doesn't work. I, I, I have been in companies where the product partnership side has been okay. It really doesn't add value. But the agency side is immensely valuable because we were going after big customers who almost always had agency partners who then brought us the leads who we could then go and convert. So, you, so start with enablement, look at it as a pipeline, as a funnel, and say how much, you know, what are we getting out of it? Then go to the partner acquisition side. Yeah, but how do you, comp like, say, should we expect the LTV over CAC, yeah. like, better or similar to the main sales motion? 100% it should be better than any inbound channel that you have. Okay. So your ARPU that you get from a partner should be four or five times more than what you get from an inbound, particularly if you have a self-serve motion. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So uh, I had a question specifically about those transition moments in the yeah. company. So when you're thinking about adding new products or when you are adding new products or yeah. markets or whatever, and you have the brand question, the positioning question, yeah. also that red thread question, like how have you dealt with like the CEO and other executives around, okay, it's really time to evolve. And when you, it's time to evolve the brand, the positioning, yeah. there's components of product, there's components of yeah. customer success. And like, what have you done to push the company to evolve in yeah. one direction yeah. versus, you know, pushing the marketing direction, but maybe not having the others there with you? Oh, it's a great question because that, at the end of the day, to your point, marketing can only do so much. You have to get the alignment of the company. So, <laughs> you know, the, be, the best thing to create urgency about going in a different <laughs> direction is to provide competitive data. When you know a competitor is killing you in a certain market, it automatically creates a bunch of urgency. So that's one thing that I always look at is, <laughs> Um, so we have a bunch of competitors. What are they doing in the market and how are they improving their, either their market share or X, Y, and Z in certain markets? Even to the extent of, you know, um, we recently looked at our competitors and who they were hiring in which geography to see what kind of people they're uh, using. And so that's a big, big um, uh, uh, lever that creates urgency in the company. The second lever I would say is, you, when we do product marketing, if you get product marketing right, product marketing is not just about launching the products you already have, it's about creating white space opportunities. So you're thinking about customers, their need states, where we are not serving them, and really creating a frame around, hey, look, this is whole, one whole use case that our customers are not being uh, are, uh, a need, but nobody's serving them in the market. So product, let's sit down together and see what we can do. Either buy a company that like attaches to a product that solves that use case or go build your own. And when you do those kinds of things and you start to create um, the white space, it becomes really apparent that, okay, we are not, uh, we are not playing in all of the aspects of the, the value equation for our customers. We are not unlocking enough value. Um, and then the third thing um, I'll say is, well, the, this, the, going back to the partner ecosystem, that's a huge source of feedback yeah. about the market, right? You go sit down, you have a partner advisory board, you sit down with them and say, guys, what are we not doing that other people are doing? Tell us everything. What do our customers want? You know, like, tell us, that becomes a huge source of like, urgency and information about what's happening in the market. Great, thank you. Thank you, great question. Um, another metric question here I think will be pretty quick. If I go back specific to brand investment, I think it was yep. point number four. Um, how do you measure the effectiveness of your out-of-home brand spend? And I think you mentioned the London Tube as an example. Yeah. Um, at the highest level, you get impressions, which are basic vanity metrics. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think there's a couple of different layers of metrics when I think about brand. At the highest level, I think about uh, this idea of unaided recall and aided recall. Unaided recall is basically people who don't know you, how many of them will pick you? Aided recall is um, if you present a bunch of competitors, how many of them pick you? So if you're doing brand right, particularly out of home or tube or whatever in certain markets, 
then your unaided and aided recall should go up by a couple of percentage points. So that's an easy, that's a, it's a bit of a lagging indicator because you won't know that immediately, you'll only know that three months from now, right? The, the bigger question is, can you sustain that going forward? And then what, do, what would it need to continue to sustain it? And what's the investment required? So that's one part of it. The second part of it, in my opinion, is actually the more important one is um, Google branded search volumes. So if you have done brand right and you've picked the right geographies, your Google branded search volume should show an uptick and con continue to show an uptick. And of course, so it's not an isolated out of home. You would have to follow that up with events and yep. nurture sequences or emails or whatever else to continue to get that halo effect of what you're doing. Yeah, it makes sense. It's, it's part of a collective in yeah, a sense. Yeah, okay. 100%. Yeah, it's Perfect. a tide that lifts all boats type of thing. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, thanks. Uh, I was wondering if you could go just show the slide 15 or 16 again, if that's possible. The one that was the, the slider between PLG and SLG. Yeah. Those, yeah. That ta those tactics were great. I wanted to take a look again and snap yeah, a photo. Absolutely. I missed it the first time around. Thanks. That's all. I think I go back some more. Keep going back, actually. Keep going back. Yeah. Thank you. You have time for one more? Oh, yeah. I have five more minutes. Awesome. You mentioned commission-based compensation for yep. demand gen folks in marketing. Yep. I wanted to see yep. if you could get into more details on that. Yeah. Um, so a couple of models there, right? Um, depending on your the way you've set up your funnel, and assume for a second that you've got the standard funnel, MQL, SQL, um, closed one, right? And MRR. Uh, you can either compensate uh, or create commission plans based on a combination of MQL and SQL or SQL and closed one or SQL and MRR, something like that, depending on uh, where you think the biggest problem is in the funnel. Is the biggest problem that we are not getting enough leads or is the biggest problem that we are not converting those leads or qualifying them or converting them? So in the past, we, I have seen commission plans that work are weighted 80, 20 in some direction. So 80 MQL, 20 SQL, or uh, 80 SQL, 20 MRR type of a thing. So that helps us drive the business forward in terms of what metrics you want to uh, create. Now, the question, the, the pushback from a lot of demand gen folks is going to be, I have no control over closing. But I'd say to that, yes, we don't have uh, uh, control over how people close, but we have control over the quality of the leads. And so as a business, if we want to improve, we have to drive the quality, which basically means that you have to be held accountable to something. So it's a small portion, a portion of your commission, uh, uh, but it has to be part of your plan. Otherwise, the handoff is not going to work. Hi, uh, you were talking about uh, bifurcating customers that are ready but not informed yep. versus informed but not ready yep. and bifurcating those strategies. Yep. How do you tell and how do you measure between yeah. the two. You know, you. one uh, interesting uh, thing that I've seen is people who are uh, ready to buy something but don't know about your product, they're typically the ones who are saying, how do I do X, Y, and Z in Google, right? They're searching for the problem. They are the long tail SEO candidates. They are the ones who are saying, what's the best marketing automation provider, best X, Y, and Z? And they're the people who don't know your brand, but they have a problem that they want to try to solve. Whereas the people who know about you, um, going back to the gentleman who asked about the brand question, uh, in certain markets, you know your brand awareness is high. So you know that people know about you. They may not know what you do, right? or they may, not like, uh, they may not like you because your brand perception is poor, but they know about you, and they're just not in the market. So I'll put a plug for Sixth Sense, who, which I really love. They, they are a really good tool to figure out uh, who who are in the market at any point of time and who are in the process of buying or who are in the market to buy because they have a, a problem. So it kind of addresses that bottom left part of your um, uh, matrix. All right, anybody else? Amazing, thank you so much for listening. Hope you have a wonderful day.